Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's very nice to be here. Um, I've had a nice day. The workshop that Steve organized, um, Rhythm and Speech and Music, was fascinating. And it's really nice to be here and to get a chance to tell you about some of this work on relations between linguistic and non-linguistic sound systems, empirical studies. Before I launch in, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Society for Music Perception and Cognition. Um, we recently redesigned our website. This is a society for people interested in the scholarly study of music in the mind. And I invite you to come check out the website. You can just Google SMPC. It'll take you there. And we have a um, list of events, including this next Society for Music Perception and Cognition conference in August in Rochester at the Eastman School of Music. For students, this is a particularly great chance to get an overview of the field. And there's videos uh, related to music cognition and resources and, and all sorts of stuff and a way to join. So if you're interested, please consider joining. So for a while now, I've been looking at uh, the relationship between music and language, uh, using comparative research to address the mechanisms by which humans process rhythm, melody, syntax, and meaning in acoustic signals. And it's been sort of an empirical and multi-level approach, taking into account acoustics, uh, perception, cognition, and neurobiology. And some of the work and a lot of other people's work in this domain is summarized in the book that Steve mentioned, that Music, Language, and the Brain. Today, I want to explore two links between speech and non-speech. One is inspired by Steve and his invitation to come here. Um, it's about timbre, which is not something I've worked on very much, but I have one study, and that's what I want to talk about today. And I want to examine a timbre-based musical system and, and how it reflects linguistic principles. And this is work done in collaboration with John Everson and Aditya Sri. And in the second part of the talk, um, I want to talk about cultural differences in basic auditory processing. In particular, the perception of rhythmic grouping in tone sequences and how this reflects native language rhythm. Now, this second part will be brief because it's all published. I kind of want to focus on the first part because it's not published aside from a single conference paper. And in fact, I'd be very interested in your input and ideas about other things we might look at as we get this ready for publication. So let's just start by talking a little bit about timbre. Um, this is a core attribute of sound. We think of sound as having some key attributes such as pitch, duration, loudness, location, and timbre. And timbre is sometimes defined by exclusion as that, that which makes two sounds different if they're the same pitch, duration, loudness, and location, and you can still distinguish them. So for example, if you play the note A440 on a clarinet, and you play it on a cucophone, which is a cucumber, um, it's been hollowed out, um, they'll, they'll sound different even if they have the same pitch, duration, loudness, location. They have different sound qualities or timbres. Some of the key acoustic correlates that have been studied by Steve and others include the relative weight of high versus low frequency, the spectral centroid or the brightness, the attack time or the amplitude envelope, the spectral shape of a sound and its evolution over time. And timbral contrasts are really essential to speech. They're sort of fundamental to how we communicate with speech. All languages use phonemes. That's sort of, you can think of that as sort of an inventory of discrete or distinct timbres or sound qualities. Um, and the average phoneme size in language is about 27, so about 27 distinct timbres is what we use to communicate with speech. And we do it, how do we do that? Well, how do we generate timbral diversity with speech? Well, one way is um, the vowels that differ in their, their timbre, uh, reflecting changes in the vocal tract shape or resonances of the vocal tract. So in this kind of schematic of the vocal tract, here are the lips, you're looking from the side. So here's the lips, that's the tongue body, that sort of humped thing, this narrow canal is the vocal tract. Um, it's shaped differently for different vowels, creating different resonant properties of the vocal tract. So for example, this is the way the vowel tra vocal tract is shaped for the E and beat, and for the, uh, the A and bat. And you can see differences in the spectrum. This is a broadband spectrogram showing the different location of the resonances or formats, um, depending on how the vocal tract is shaped, giving the sounds a different color, a different quality that we call the different vowels. Consonants generate their timbral diversity uh, by changes in place and manner of articulation. So for example, here's a little uh, slide from um, Lada Fogut and Mag Madison's book on sounds of the world's languages. Again, a side view of the vocal tract, the lips here, the nose here, and the vocal tract here. And all these lines, uh, numbered lines, represent different places where the vocal tract can be constricted to create a consonantal articulation. So for example, uh, you can differ in the place you make this constriction and the way you make the constriction, what's called place and manner. So if you make the constriction at the lips, a bilabial constriction, and you make it in a manner that is plosive, that is total closure of the vocal tract, followed by a sudden release, you'll get a B or a P. If you make it in uh, bilabial, but you make a nasal manner, sort of uh, where you drop the velum while you close the lips, you get a different nasal sound and so on. So there's kind of a matrix here of where you make the constriction and how you make the constriction, leading to a different kind of sound quality, which we call consonants. <coughs> 
Well, timbre also plays an important role in music. It's crucial for recognizing and tracking sound sources. Uh, if you want to listen to a cello in an, uh, kind of a string quartet, you can lock in on its sort of sound quality and follow it. And that's, its sound quality is part of how you recognize it. And variations in timbre can, exp can convey things like expressiveness or, or the mastery of an instrument. You think about a great master of a cello will sound different, just their, their sound, even a single note will sound different from a novice, um, playing the same note at the same pitch and so forth. Um, yet timbre is rarely a form-bearing dimension in music, to borrow Steve McAdam's term. That is a basis for categorical contrast and structure building, which is unlike pitch or duration, which often play that role in music. And this is, again, unlike language, where timbre is a form-bearing dimension making these contrasts between phonemes. And you might ask, why? Why is it not so commonly a form-bearing dimension in music? Are there biomechanical factors, perhaps because it's difficult, difficult to make an instrument that changes timbre quickly from note to note in dramatic ways? Are there cognitive reasons um, why timbre is not a, a uh, form-bearing parameter often? Uh, this is something Steve has looked at with his work on timbre intervals. It's very interesting. But there are a couple of ancient timbre-based musics. <coughs> Examples of what successful Klangfarben melody um, or timbre melody. And some of them use vocal tracks to produce non linguistic timbral diversity. For example, the didgeridoo, um, where the, the, the player's vocal tract is generating a lot of timbral diversity that then gets amplified through this kind of tube. Or the jaws harp, where the vocal tract is changed in shape uh, as it's excited by this, this vibrating thing, and that creates all these interesting different timbres. So those are systems in which timbre diversity does play a, a fundamental role. But there are other uh, ancient timbre-based musics that use instruments, so uh, non-living things to produce sounds, but implicitly use language-like principles to organize their sound patterns. And I think that's sort of an interesting um, idea, especially in terms of contemporary music, because people in contemporary music are often very interested in how do you make timbre a form-bearing dimension in music. So it's interesting to look at an instrument that does this successfully and how it does it. <coughs> the instrument I want to focus on today is the tabla of North India. Um, it's a rhythmic, uh, it's shown down here, it's a, a set of hand drums, one played with the left hand and one played with the right hand, and they provide a rhythmic accompaniment to melodic instruments, but they have their own incredible complexity in terms of the rhythms that they produce. It's a very elaborate, complex system. And the central claim I want to make today for this part of the talk is that tabla drumming is a non-linguistic system with a symbiotic relationship to vocal timbre, by which I mean um, symbiotic in terms of how timbral contrasts are created by the instrument, in terms of how drum sounds are symbolized verbally, and in term, perhaps, and we'll get to this at the end, in terms of a hypothesis, in terms of how they're processed by the brain, uh, the timbres. Okay, so just a brief note on tabla acoustics. Now, uh, as is typical of drums, the sounds of the tabla have a sharp attack, <coughs> sharp attack as the drum is struck, but it's interesting that the, the stretched membrane has, is tuned in a certain way that it yields a very bell-like ringing quality. <coughs> and um, so there are these different modes of vibration in the membrane when it's struck. Um, but due to this, this iron, paste, uh, iron uh, filling and paste patch called the shihai, which uh, sits on top of the drums in sort of a raised um, sort of bump, uh, that actually changes the tuning of the membrane, making the, these modes go from inharmonic to more, more harmonic. So it gives the, the instrument a bell-like quality when it's struck, which is really interesting. And just dis distinct drum strokes produce distinct timbres. And I want to illustrate that, you, illustrate that for you with just three. Uh, what's shown here on the left of each of these movies is um, kind of a static diagram of how the fingers hit the drum for this stroke. So this is one stroke where the index finger hits the rim of the drum while the third finger rests lightly on the drum head. Uh, this is one where the left hand, that's the right drum, this is one where the left hand hits the head of the drum with one finger um, while the palm rests on the drum head. And here's one where it combines these two to make a combined stroke. Um, with a different sound. Now I'm going to play these movies and I was just testing the system before you all arrived and uh, in an ideal world I would click on this and the movie would just show in situ but apparently it's going to, it reformats and then takes over the whole screen and then I'll have to go back and forth a bit between the screen and the PowerPoint so just forgive me and you'll hear sound before the movie starts to play but he plays everything three times so hopefully you'll get to see him play it. So this is one of these drum strokes. Is that visible to everybody? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to come back here. And this is the next one. Okay, quite a different timbre. And okay. And then this one is the combined one. 
So he's doing what he did with his right hand and what he did with his left hand at the same time now. Okay, so this is some examples of different dumb strokes producing different timbres. So here's this first symbiosis between linguistic and musical timbre. The timbral contrasts in this instrument are created kind of quasi-linguistically. What do I mean by that? Well, they're created via variation in place and manner of articulation, I would argue, um, where the articulators are the fingers and the place is where the drum is hit. So each drum has uh, three regions, a rim, um, a head, and then this patch, and you can hit in any of those regions. And it's very, speci very specific where you're supposed to hit for these different strokes. And the manner, how the drum is hit. So which drum is hit, large, small, or both. Whether it's a closed stroke where you whack the drum and you keep your finger down or you bounce off it. How many fingers hit the drum, what order they hit them, and so on. So there's place and manner variation creating this kind of matrix of sounds. And this yields about 10 to 20 distinct dif different drum strokes or timbres that this instrument can produce. Okay. So the second symbiosis is there's a verbal symbolization for these drum sounds. There's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a nonsense syllable vocable language to name the drum sounds. So each different drum stroke is associated with a different nonsense syllable or bowl, what's called a bowl in the Hindi tradition. This is an old oral tradition. Uh, tabla is typically not written down, the music for tabla, so it's communicated orally by speaking these bowls uh, between players or from guru to student. Um, and by using the bowls, you can communicate exactly what the drum sequence could be it should be just by using verbal symbols. So for example, those ones, those movies we saw earlier, that first stroke is called ta, the second stroke is called ge, and that third combined stroke is called da. Now there's some variation in naming these bowls from one school or garana to the other, and there's some constant context-dependent variation in the, the way the bowls are named uh, within tradition. So if you say one bowl after another, if a, you know, if a ka follows a ge, it might be ki or something like that, but there's a lot of consistency in how bowls are named too. And that's what is interesting from the standpoint of acoustic symbolism. Um, bowls use a diverse set of consonants, these, these nonsense syllables. So here are some, they're underlined in red here. These are the uh, consonants in Hindi. And you can see that they're mostly uh, um, stop consonants, which makes sense uh, as onset consonants for these bowls because these are consonants that provide a strong, clear acoustic burst, kind of a whacking-like sound. Um, and they use a diverse set of vowels as well, which is sort of interesting. So here's just some of the vowels in Hindi, underlined in red, that are used for bowls. Okay, so that's the kind of the uh, theoretical description. But let me give you uh, an, an example of what this is like in real life. So I want to show you a movie <coughs> that I took in Bombay in, in, uh, when I was doing this research. And this is a professional tabla player, Pandit Nayan Ghosh. And he's going to speak a sequence of bowls. It's, it's actually 82 of them. <coughs> and then he's going to play the corresponding sequence on the drums. And after he plays that, then he gets into kind of improvising a bit and going even faster. And you'll see that speed is uh, part of what is make, makes this tradition so impressive. <coughs> and as you're watching this, note how the drum sound timbres are rather diverse, but they're not too diverse. You don't get streaming. You don't get you know, them flying off in different perceptual directions. They're kind of a unified thing, but they are diverse. And uh, that video, this video is also available on my book's website if you'd like to see it again later. All right, let's just play it. This guy rocks. <laughs> um, all right. So let me just, that example, um, the first 82 bowls and the first 82 jump strokes were an example of tintal, a 16-beat cycle. They're these very elaborate rhythmic cycles in which these sounds are produced. And this is a kind of a verbal transcription of what he said. I've kind of blown up the first line. And the, the, the red letters represent the onsets of the beats in this 16-beat cycle. So that's four beats worth of music right there. And uh, then this is the rest of it. And now that you see it on the screen, I'll play it again for you. And uh, you can try and follow along. Wow. All right. And there's the drumming. I got cut off. Um, all right, but what I want to do now is 
uh, overlay them. So he plays them sequentially, right? He speaks them and then he plays them. But now I've excised them and zero, zero time aligned them. So you can hear to what extent the timing of his bowls um, lines up with the timing of the spoken bowls, tines, lines up with the timing of the drum bowls. <laughs> It's pretty close. Um, uh, just to show you, he's using a quite a diverse set of bowls in this composition, ta, ki, da, tra, ka, di, and so on. But, um, and he's going to about eight and a half bowls per second when he speaks, which is really pretty fast. Um, oh, by the way, some of these um, bowls that are frequently combined uh, become sort of like words or chunks that act as units. So for example, takita, da, tra, ka, gadigana, and so forth. So that's another way in which this sort of linguistic is this building up of, of structure into larger units. But let me just show you um, a quick analysis of the timing of those bowls. So th what I'm plotting here is the onset times of his spoken bowls in that passage. So here there's 82 bowls and this is just the onset times of the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, all the way from number one to 82. Okay. And then we can do the same thing with the drummed bowls. We can give them, start them at their time zero and overlay them and they overlay pretty darn well. Uh, he starts, to, there's a little bit of lag here towards the end, but for a very long section here, it's almost spot on. So clearly bowls reflect the timing of drum strokes, and that's one of the things they're used to do, is to communicate timing in, in when you're teaching a composition, I mean, when you're teaching a student or composing a um, piece. In fact, uh, it's, it's really charming these days. Uh, so in, in the traditional Indian world, you live with your guru, and you, know, you meet with him daily, and you, you know, cook his breakfast, and he teaches you all this stuff verbally one-on-one, -on -one, but in today's modern world, oh, excuse me. Uh, Oh, that's a really great question. Um, this was done, this was taken from that video, so he spoke them and immediately played them. But that's a great idea if you get them to, get them to speak it and then you ask him to play it a week later, would that be that same kind of lineup? Um, okay, so anyway, the, oh, so the cell phone story. So uh, the, I, I, I did some of this research in collaboration with a professional tabla player, Anuradha Pal, who lives in India and in Bombay. And she was telling me these days, you know, you, you, nobody has time to go and live with their guru for years, so there's a lot of you know, you have to get together when you can, and sometimes, sometimes you take your lesson over the cell phone, you know, so you'll be, he'll call you from his taxi to the airport, and you'll, you'll pick up the phone and go, hello, and the other end will go, so, you know, it's, it's like, that's your lesson for the day. So, um, all right, so, uh, bowls clearly reflect the timing of drum strokes, a very effective way to encode those patterns. But do bowls reflect the timbres of drum strokes, or is the mapping arbitrary, as in solfege? So in, in Western music, we have do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, or in Indian music, sa, re, gama, pa, da, ni, sa, which is a way of naming pitches, but it's not particularly representative of the sounds of the pitches in any way. But what about these tabla voc vocables? Um, how strong is the symbiosis between vocal and drum timbres in the bowl system? So we conducted an acoustic and perceptual study focusing on eight of the core bowls. Uh, we looked, this was done with six professional tabla players, one of them female, recorded at a professional sound studio in Mumbai. All used the same set of drums, and each played basic strokes and spoke the related bowls five times each. So speak and play five times each, each bowl. And then we analyzed that set, both the speech tokens and the bowl tokens for these acoustic uh, studies. So we had a population of about 30 um, spoken bowls and 30 drum bowls for every thing we, stu we studied. And all this acoustic analysis was done in signal um, a, a digital programming language for sound analysis. Okay, so here are the b drum strokes and bowls we studied, and uh, I'll just show you a movie of them. Um, and again, I, unfortunately, this will take over the screen, so you can't look at these descriptions while you watch the movie. But basically, they're eight, and uh, they're thin. Uh, um, well, we won't go through the names. Let me just play them. Let me just play the movie for you. And this is just written descriptions of what he does with his hands, but you'll be able to see it. Okay, that's number one. He plays everything three times. This is Aditya Sri, by the way, the student. That's number two. That's number three. Four. Six. Seven. 
And this, you've seen this before, this is the combined one. Okay, so you can see they produce different distinct sounds. So what we did was we focused on pairs, we kind of analyzed them in pairs, examined a salient acoustic difference for each pair. Um, so we looked at uh, Tun versus Tin, the first two that he played, in differences in their spectral brightness, or centroid. Cut versus Gay, which is the second two he played, and I'll play these for you again, so you'll, you'll see them again. They looked at the abrupt, abruptness of the offset. Tra versus Kra, and we looked at the interval between impacts, and Ta versus Da, we looked at pitch to start with. And so we looked at the drum sounds to begin with in this kind of paired comparison way. But what we wanted to do then is examine if and how each of those differences are reflected in the spoken bowls, because the, the voice and the drum make sounds in very different ways, kind of mechanistically. So what is the voice doing to kind of capture these differences in, in uh, drum sound quality? Okay, let's just go through these. So this is tun and tin, and um, okay, I guess to remind, well, do you all remember this or should I play it again? Uh huh. Oh, I can. All right, I can try and do that. All right, so here's uh, so here's dun, dun, dun. All right, and uh, again, sorry again with this PowerPoint thing. And this is thin, 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 thin. Okay. So um, those are the two, okay, so then if you look at their spectrograms, this is dun and this is thin, one thing that's very saliently different is that in thun, the fundamental is the strongest partial. So he hits the drum head and he bounces off it and the, the fundamental of the drum head is allowed to ring. In thin, he hits the rim and he damps the drum head with the third finger. It stays, uh, it stays there. And that actually damps the fundamental out, so you don't get it. You get only the higher partial, so you get this more bell-like sound. So that changes the spectral balance. You get this kind of darker sound here and a brighter sound here because the high energy harmonics here uh, and the damped fundamental. What about the speech? Well, tun and thin as syllables are shown here in spectrograms and one big difference is the position of the second format, a resonance of the voice. It's quite low in tun, which is part of what gives it that darker color, and hi much higher in thin. Okay, so there's a difference in the balance of energy in the spectrum of the voice. And you can measure this. By looking at the spectral centroid, you can look at the mean frequency of the first four partials in the drum weighted by their amplitudes, or in speech, the mean frequency of the first three formats weighted by their amplitudes, and you see that it, it's quite reflective. You get an increase in spectral centroid from dun to thin in speech, just as you do in the drum. Uh, okay, here's the next pair. This is cut and gay. So let's go through these. This is cut, cut, okay. And this is gay. So gay, gay. Okay. All right. All right. So um, looking at their, their um, this is just now what I'm plotting here is the time waveform on top and the uh, amplitude envelope. And I apologize, uh, it's so hard to see from back there. But basically, I think it's. So pretty clear that this has a very sharp decay and this has a much slower decay because it's allowed to ring. It's sort of resonant, slowly decaying envelope. And if you look at the, the speech syllables, this is the spectrogram of a tabla player saying cut and saying gay, and this is the amplitude envelopes. I think you can see that this one gets closed down much faster, sharper decay time than this one because it's a closed syllable with a final consonant, stop consonant versus an open syllable here. And again, this is fairly easy to quantify. You can look at the duration between the envelope peak and the point at which the envelope decays to 50% of the peak value, and as a measure of how quickly it, it's kind of shut off, and it's much faster for cut and gay and speech, and, that, and similarly uh, for the tabla sounds. All right, let's move on. So now we're at uh, tra and kra. Okay, so here's tra. 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 Okay. And Here's kra. And you can hear, hear the kind of asymmetry in the timing. It's definitely not hitting them at the same time. He's, right? There's that kind of flam. And that's important. So if you look at the spectrograms, of those sounds, um, you see they both have 
uh, dual impacts. In fact, when Aditya, the student, played tra, he, he had three impacts. He did three fingers, but the tabla players, the professionals, did two fingers, a two-finger flam for tra. And if you look at the, the, the duration between those two impacts, these two hits, it's shorter than in kra, where they're hitting the two drums with two hands. Okay, this is uh, significantly shorter than this. And in the speech, these two sounds, it's interesting, tra and kra are both, uh, both involve two quick releases in, in succession. Uh, tra, there's an, uh, two alveolar releases, the ta and the ra. And in the kra, there's a velar and an alveolar release in quick succession. But the timing is different. In tra, the, the time point between the two releases, the release of the T and the release of the R, is shorter than in kra, the release of the K and the release of the R. So again, there's this reflection of this, this acoustic difference in the drums in the voice. And you can measure this, and again, it comes out as significantly different in both domains. Okay, and lastly, Here's ta and da, so here's ta. Okay. And here is da. So da. 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 All right. Um, okay. Now, one thing that's sort of salient about these is the kind of that the da has kind of more belly to it, right? It's got this deeper frequency because you're hitting this lower pitched drum. And so, if you look at the spectrograms of the drums, you get the da with its ringing sound that fundamental is being damped by that, that finger, one of the fingers resting lightly on the drum. But da has the lower frequency of this, this deep drum uh, in combination. So, there's a deeper sound to it. So, one idea is that perhaps it's, there's a difference in the fundamental frequency of the voice. And here's a tabla player's voice saying, Ta and da. And here's the narrowband spectrogram, and the red arrow marks the fundamental frequency, um, which starts lower in the, uh, in the spoken da. And if you just measure the fundamental frequency average over the whole syllable, you find that it's lower for spoken da than for spoken ta, just as the um, frequency of the lowest partial is lower for da than for ta in the tabla. So that now we have fundamental frequency as another cue being used. But I want to look more closely at da, which is a, kind of an interesting sound. It's not, a, it's not a common sound in the world's languages. In fact, it's often in, uh, it's kind of restricted to the Indian languages. And it's got interesting acoustics. So here's a, a voice spectrogram of a tabla player saying da. Um, da, da. That's the exact sound you're seeing here. And what you see is it's, it's a, uh, there's a release of the D. And, but before the vowel starts in earnest, there's this long period of heavy aspiration, this ha sound before the ah, da, right? And that's, you know, over 100 milliseconds long. So it's very salient in perception. And it's a very Indian sort of sound. Um, now what happens in the drum? So why would you do that to imitate a drum? Drums don't have aspiration. So here's uh, the spectrogram of da, okay? And there's that kind of still shot of what it's like, the index finger hitting the rim while the, third, the second finger damps the head. Um, okay? And here's the other component of da, which is played on the other drum. Oh, shoot, sorry. Um, we can't hear the resonance so much. But basically, um, it's got this kind of low, long sound. But let me draw your attention to something. At the beginning of the sound, for about a couple hundred milliseconds, there's this pitch bend in this uh, low, lowest partial. Now, I'm not sure why. I mean, perhaps it's just biomechanics. When you, when you push down with your hand to make that hit, maybe you're just modulating the tension on the head enough that you get this pitch bend. Um, but as a consequence, when you put da and, uh, ta and ge together to make drummed da, you get this sound which has the higher harmonics contributed by the smaller drum, the lower um, pitch contributed by the lower drum, and this kind of pitch bend. Okay, That's part of what gives it that characteristic sound. So, here, so now it becomes interesting. So drummed and spoken da both have this kind of two-stage acoustic structure. So da has this kind of during FM period and this after FM period um, when everything is sort of stable in the spectrum in terms of frequencies over time. And in the speech, you've got this during aspiration period and after aspiration period that are saliently different. Well, what is, what, so what? Uh, well, it's actually interesting. These stages have an abstract sort of similarity. In both cases, there's an early domination by the low frequency followed by a more balanced spectrum. So during this little pitch bend of the da, this is the most energetic partial. It kind of dominates the sound, and then it gets more balanced as time goes on. And in spoken da, 
uh, because of the aspiration, you're not really exciting the formats very strongly, so sound is dominated by this low frequency, the fundamental. So you don't, so you don't see these strong formant bands up here. And then later on, when the formants kick in, it's a more balanced sound. And you can quantify this by looking at the ratio of energy in the low frequency to the high frequency. So for example, in the tabla, you can look at the ratio of energy in this low partial to the higher partials during the FM and after the FM, and you can see there's a dominance of low frequency energy during the FM, which drops off after the FM. And in the speech, you can look at the balance between the fundamental frequency energy and the formant energies, and it's higher during the aspiration than after the aspiration. In other words, in both domains, there's this spectrotemporal transition from low frequency dominance to a more balanced spectrum across this salient acoustic boundary. It's a similar acoustic end achieved by entirely different means because the voice and the drum are producing sounds in very different ways. So I think that's a really nice kind of example of sound symbolism of abstract qualities. Okay, so to summarize part, uh, this kind of second symbiosis I've talked about, tabla bowls reflect drum timbres using a variety of acoustic cues. There's spectral brightness or centroid, there's rate of amplitude envelope decay, there's duration between releases of consonants in a cluster, there's fundamental frequency, and there's the spectrotemporal evolution within a syllable. So in other words, they're a case of what linguists call sound symbolism or onomatopoeia. And this actually suggests that individuals without any knowledge of tabla or Indian music or Indian speech should be able to match the, the bowls and the drum sounds. So that's the next thing we tested, at least in a preliminary way, by a perception experiment. And the design was simply to present two speech and two drum sounds together, let the listeners freely listen to them, and then let them choose the mapping between the speech and the drum sounds. So a two alternative force choice. So you see little icons like this, you click on one, you get one speech sound. You click on the other, you get another speech sound. You click on this, you get one drum sound. You click on that, you get another drum sound. And the listener just has to decide what's a better mapping in terms of what matches what, what sounds like what, this mapping or this mapping. And the sound pairs were these kind of pairs we analyzed, din versus tun, or cut versus gay, or tra versus kra, or ta versus da. And we had multiple trials with different tabla speakers providing the drum sounds and the speech sounds for the different trials. Um, Seven subjects tested in the lab, then we put it on the web and got hundreds of subjects with a similar result. But I'll just show you the lab, lab results. Basically, naive subjects who knew nothing about Indian music or Indian languages could make these matchings correctly for tin versus tun, cut versus gay, and ta versus da, but they were at chance for tra versus kra, which is based on this subtle difference in the timing of two impacts. Um, so they can do it. Of course, this is a rather constrained situation where you only have to choose between two drum sounds and two speech sounds. If we'd opened it up and made the choices more uh, like if you had to try and match all eight drum sounds against all eight speech sounds, I think that would be harder. But just to summarize uh, this part of the talk and talk about some implications, I think tabla drumming is a, a non-linguistic sound system that uses language-like principles to organize its timbres. It has rapid articulation with place and manner variation in terms of the way sounds are produced, um, and musical timbres are reflected by and reflective of speech timbres via these bowls. And this leads to a, a very successful case of clung farben melody in an ancient traditional instrument. And I think this might have some implications for brain processing of musical timbre. Um, and I brought this up specifically because this is something that's been worked on here in Montreal by Dan Levitin, Stephen McAdams, and colleagues in their neuroimaging studies of timbre. So there's some work by Pascal Balin, who's another person who spends a lot of time in Montreal, that, um, suggesting that there are voice sensitive areas in the human brain. These are areas that are particularly responsive to human voices as opposed to other complex sounds. And it sort of makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint that we would have regions that are kind of special, specifically uh, interested in voices. These are bilateral temporal areas which show stronger responses to vocal versus non-vocal sounds of similar acoustic complexity. So this is a slide from um, a paper that just came out, uh, this should, sorry, this should be 2011, Current Biology. It just came out in Current Biology, a little review by Latinus and Belin, um, showing some of these areas in the superior temporal sulcus, these temporal voice areas as they call them, but they're on both sides of the brain. This shows the right side. And these are sp spectrograms um, that are supposed to represent the fact that they test the specificity, uh, selectivity of these responses using voice sounds and the non-vocal sounds of similar acoustic complexity. All right, well, I would like to predict, based on the study that we've done, that tabla players would show a similar response to spoken bowls and the corresponding drum sounds in these voice sensitive areas of the brain. So these bowls, I mean, these drum sounds sound nothing like a voice. No one would ever confuse them with a voice. And yet I think that perhaps they would activate these voice areas uh, when listening to them. It would be an example of sort of timbral symbiosis between music and language in the brain. And I think it would be achieved via mechanisms of neuroplasticity, reflecting the fact, uh, or due to the fact uh, that there's this language-like organization of tabla sounds, due to the fact that they have this acoustic relationship to voice timbre, and the fact that tabla players have extensive experience mapping drum sounds onto vocal sounds.
And a corollary prediction then is that in these tabla players, these voice areas will not respond as strongly to unfamiliar drum sounds. It's the, stu- it's the sounds that they've learned to map onto musical sounds and to produce with these kinds of quasi-linguistic contrasts that will activate these voice areas. So that's a testable prediction one could, one could look at. All right, so now let me move on to the second part of the talk, which will be briefer. Um, and that has to do with cultural differences in basic auditory processing. And it has to do with the perception of rhythmic grouping in tone sequences and how it reflects native language rhythm. And this was done with John Everson and Kengo Oguchi in Japan, at Kyoto, in Kyoto. <coughs> so the fundamental kind of underlying theoretical question is how culturally variable is non-linguistic auditory perception? Well, for complex patterns such as music, we know it's actually quite variable. So there's work by Steve McAdams in collaboration with uh, IRE published in Music Perception, looking at the perception of Arabic music and how that differs if you're an uh, enculturated listener versus a non-enculturated listener in terms of where you hear boundaries and so forth. Um, Hannon and Triab have done work with Balkan rhythms, showing that if you grow up hearing these things, you, you perceive them differently than somebody who hasn't because of their complex meters. Um, but these are complex music. But what about simple patterns? What about patterns with minimal acoustic variation? Are those... Uh, but presumably such patterns engage rather quote-unquote primitive auditory mechanisms. Are those uh, shaped by experience? Can culture reach down and influence even those uh, mechanisms that process very simple sound patterns? Well, there's a provocative claim that, that, that such things do happen, and this goes all the way back to a foundational text in, in linguistics. This is uh, from Preliminaries to Speech Analysis by Jakobsen, Font, and Halle, where they laid out the theory of distinctive features. Um, but in, there's a little quote in that, in the early in that book, uh, where they basically claim that our native language shapes the way we perceive simple non-linguistic rhythms. And I want to read it to you because it's so charming. It's a 50-year-old claim. They write, interference by the language pattern affects even our responses to non-speech sounds. Knocks produced at even intervals, with every third louder, are perceived as groups of three separated by a pause. The pause is usually claimed by a check to fall before the louder knock, by a Frenchman to fall <laughs> after the louder, while a Pole hears the pause one knock after the louder. The different perceptions correspond exactly to the positions of word stress in the languages involved. In Czech, the stress is on the initial syllable, in French, on the final, and in Polish, on the penult. Well, what is this saying? It's saying that if you play just the sequence of simple non-linguistic sounds to a listener that are sort of loud, soft, soft, loud, soft, soft, is symbolized by these X's, and it's sort of ambiguous how they begin, so it's just kind of going on, and you ask, what do they hear? What's the basic chunk that they hear repeating? Somebody, a native speaker of French will say, I hear this chunk, that go, uh, that loud, soft, soft. That's the repeating chunk. A native speaker of French would say, no, I hear soft, soft, loud. That's the repeating chunk. And a native speaker of Polish would say, no, I hear soft, loud, soft. That's the repeating chunk. And I actually once talked to Morris Halle, unfortunately the only last living um, author of that book, where this idea came from. He said, I said, who were these Czech, French, and Polish speakers? He said, they were all Jakobsen. So, he was <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it wasn't exactly produced with a lot of evidence. It was an interesting intuition. All right, so <laughs> no evidence, and even worse for that, uh, worse for their claim, there's this 100-year-old claim that rhythm, perception of non-linguistic rhythmic grouping follows universal principles. And this was studied back in the 1800s and the early 1900s. It's been replicated many times. So one of the principles um, is that when sounds vary in amplitude, a louder sound tends to be perceived as group initial. And these types of studies are r- typically conducted with very simple tone sequences that just vary in one parameter. So ex- schematically here, tones that are uh, just vary in amplitude. So the pitch is the same uh, and everything else is the same. It's just amplitude variation. And they sort of are ongoing and you ask the people how, how they chunk them. And the claim is that people will chunk that as loud as the initial uh, element in the sequence. And there's a claim for about duration that the, that the longer sounds tend to be perceived as group final. So again, simple stimuli varying in duration, short, long, short, long, short, long. The claim is that people will, will hear and report short, long as the fundamental chunk they hear repeating. And um, I'll go ahead and play these for you, and you can decide how you hear them. Although bear in mind, if you have studied music, that can influence how you hear these things. And I imagine almost everybody in here has studied music. So, but anyway, let's start with this one. Uh, and I hope it's not too loud. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> 
Yeah. So if you hear it going ba-ba, 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 that's the loud soft grouping. And here's the duration one. Okay, and you can decide for yourself how you hear that. Um, but the claim is that uh, there's kind of a consistency, and it's been tested in uh, several Western cultures in, in France, in America, in England, in the Netherlands, and it's pretty consistent results in terms of these preferences. Um, modulo, as I mentioned, if you, if you know music well, you, this one especially, um, because of the way you would notate it, you might group differently. Also, this, this, this bias has been shown for eight-month-old infants by Laurel Trainer using a kind of infant uh, paradigms that you allow you to tell how infants are hearing things. And um, this is a basis for a, a law that's been proposed by Bruce Hayes, a, a very uh, wonderful phonologist at UCLA, the iambic trochaic law. But are these principles use really universal or innate? So we decided to look at this by going outside of Western culture and testing native speakers of English and Japanese. So this is in collaboration with, with uh, Kengo Oguchi in Kyoto. So we used the, just the kinds of tone sequences you heard that vary either only in amplitude or only in duration, with sort of a fade in and a fade out to make it ambiguous about how they, begun, they began. Otherwise, you get biases depending on what they hear as the first note. They had a steady state of about five seconds, and these were 500 hertz complex tones with a bass duration of 150 or 250 milliseconds. And we tried a few different ratios of amplitude and duration just to make sure it wasn't just one thing we were looking at. And 50 participants per culture, college age kids. So again, these sequences are really simple. Here's an amplitude sequence. It fades in, has a steady state, and it fades out. And we're just asking people to indicate their grouping by circling images in booklets. Okay, so briefly on the results. For this amplitude pattern, both cultures agreed. They both perceived the loud soft as the basic grouping. But in duration, we perceived that we got a salient cultural difference. So the Americans followed the so-called universal rule. They strongly perceived this as the basic chunk that was repeating. But many Japanese very strongly reported they heard this as the basic chunk. And there was he more heterogeneity among the Japanese. There were some who heard it like this, and there were some who were kind of in between. But the modal response was this, which was very rare among English listeners. So this kind of overturned this 100-year-old rule of perception, and, and we replicated it with listeners in several parts of Japan just to make sure it was solid. And that's all published in JAZA, which was I'm going light on the details in 2008. The, all the details are there. So what's the origin of the cultural difference? Um, well, we assume it's experience dependent. It's not an innate difference. And the rhythms of music and speech seem to be the most logical place to look for influences on how people might develop these different grouping biases. But where might long-short versus short-long rhythms be an important cue for grouping? Well, we looked at music, the rhythm of phrase onsets. We thought maybe in music, Western music tends to start with short, long rhythms. There's a lot of anacrusis. Um, like think of the beginning of green sleeves. Ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba. So there's this short, long, short, long. Maybe there's, that's characteristic of Western music and Japanese music is the other way. That didn't work. Uh, that didn't explain it. So then we looked at language and we thought, well, what about the rhythm, not of words, which is what Jakobson, Fonts, and Holly were talking about, but of short phrases. Um, and also words, but we want to focus on short phrases here. So our hypothesis is that it reflects something about linguistic phrase structure, not word structure, and particularly something syntactic in the language, something rather abstract. That is the order of what are called function and content words, or what linguists call the head direction parameter in language. So in English, the function words, the little grammatical words, are before their associated content words. We say the book, a dog, to bed. So there's this very strong short long tendency in the way that's put together. In Japanese, it flips it on its head. These little grammatical particles that indicate subject, direct object, and so forth come after the words. So you say hono, jonga. So the language is full of these long, short particles, at least when you look at one function word married to one monosyllabic content word. And this is actually consistent with this short, long grouping they see in English uh, French listeners and Dutch listeners. So we know French is very different from English rhythmically as a language, so-called syllable time versus an English, which is a stress time language. But syntactically, they, they're, they're similar. They put the function word before the content word. They say le livre in France for the book, or in Dutch, het boek. And if you actually look empirically at the distribution of, of kind of um, syllable duration ratios in these kind of chunks, these sort of little syntactic chunks in a corpus of English, this is from the switchboard corpus, and you look at the syllable duration ratio between the first and the second syllable for whenever you get a function and content word together, there's a big bias for it to be short long because of the syntactic feature, and Japanese goes the other way. All right, so if you take this kind of language-based hypothesis, you can make some predictions. In particular, the grouping preferences for these tone sequences should be uh, predicted by a language's linguistic structure. 
So you should be able to go to a language, look at its linguistic structure, and predict how people will hear these tone sequences. Now it happens that all the research that was done on this that led to this universal claims was done in Western Europe where uh, function words are phrase initial. And we looked at one culture where function words are phrase final, out here in Japan. This is a wonderful uh, map from the World Atlas of Language Structures, by the way. And you could ask how many languages place function words at the end of a phrase. Is this some weird thing, an unusual thing? Well, no. There's a heck of a lot. And in fact, there's a bunch in India, which is convenient. So I think I'll try and test this sometime when I'm back there. Uh, that you can predict how people will speak, hear these, these, um, these patterns. Another way of looking at this, so for example, Turkish, Korean, and Marathi would be ones where you would predict people would hear the long short grouping. Another way of looking at this was provided by a nice paper that just came out in Nature by Dunn et al. from the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics. And they were looking at word order uh, patterns across languages. And this diagram, which I realize is very hard to see, is a tree of Indo-European languages. And so uh, here's Danish, uh, English, here's the Romance languages, Romanian, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, and so forth. Um, and what, what I want you to look at are the red squares, which are um, languages where they put the ad position before the noun or prepositions. And whereas the blue squares are ones where they put the ad position after the noun or postpositions. And you can see, if you'd done this research basically anywhere in Western Europe, you would have gotten this idea that it's universal because all these languages are this way. But if you'd done it in India, you might have gotten a completely different answer when you started to do this research. These are all the Indian languages down here. Okay. So finally, um, this idea of, of a language influence also leads to ideas for developmental studies. And we have some recent developmental evidence for a language influence. As I told you, there's this prior work on eight-month-old infants showing that they show this short, long bias in how they group these sounds, these tones. Now, this was only done with English-immersed infants in, in Canada, actually in Toronto. Um, but sensitivity to the native language's word order emerges around that same time, around eight months. So what if you look before um, that time what, and before this uh, bias emerges in perception? So we looked at six-month-olds in Canada and Japan. And this was in collaboration with Janet Worker's lab uh, in Vancouver. And her student, Katie Yoshida, did this work, really nice work. And they have sophisticated ways of testing baby uh, perception of rhythm. You can't get them to circle diagrams in booklets. So you have ways of ha having them look at certain speakers when they hear certain things. It's a very well-developed uh, methodology. What we basically found was that at six months of old, Japanese and uh, Canadian, English immersed Canadian infants showed no bias for hearing the grouping one way or the other. It, but at eight months, they were already starting to show their culture-specific biases around the time that word order sensitivity develops. And this was published in Cognition uh, last year. So to summarize part two, so there's, there's this old traditional claim that basic non-linguistic auditory processing principles shape speech perception. But we'd like to suggest in this case, we see language experience may actually shape basic auditory processing. So it's kind of a different picture than we normally think of. Um, and I wonder how many other quote unquote primitive auditory processes are shaped by linguistic experience. And this is something one could look at in a lot of different basic auditory processes that are typically only studied non-linguistically. So that's basically it. And just to conclude, um, and sort of the big picture messages, I think in auditory perception, the research is often compartmentalized. We have our linguists studying phonetics and phonology, and we have our psychoacousticians or music acousticians studying non-linguistic tone sequence processing. But even though the, the the research is compartmentalized. The phenomena aren't necessarily compartmentalized. And linguistic and non-linguistic processing often have some interesting and hidden, not so obvious connections. And I think exploring those connections provides novel ways to study basic mechanisms of auditory cognition. And comparative research can deepen our understanding of how humans make sense out of sound. With that, I will conclude. Thanks for your attention.